Whether you're a camel owner, wannabe camel owner, or simply an adoring camel fan, you're in the right place for some fun, useful, and interesting camel talk. This is the Camel Connection Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Tara. And I'm Russell. Join us here for fun learning about camels, how to care for, train, and handle them, plus insider stories and interviews. And also some interesting stories of our lifestyle with camels, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the very funny. Make sure you've subscribed now so you don't miss out on an episode. podcasts are an audio take of our video so be sure to check those out on our blog for lots of how-to visuals and of course lots of camels this is your one and only go-to podcast all about camels hello everyone welcome back hey we're back here and uh, we've got a really interesting topic today. And this is the Camel Connection podcast. You forgot to say that. But we kind of said that at the start in the intro. No, you just said it then. Oh. <laughs> so we didn't forget at all. So yeah, we're here again mm-hmm. with an amazing to- topic for you. And if we sound a bit nasally, it's because we are. Um, we've got colds. We've all got colds in, yeah. in this family. We've all had days off work and days off school and all that sort of stuff. So... Mm. Um, Prior warning, but yeah, I will try not to cough into the microphone. Or sneeze. <laughs> or sneeze. You've been sneezing like crazy. Oh, you well, broke your rib, I think. Oh, I think I've broken through. <laughs> but if you're suffering from a cold, we feel you. Um, we're going through it. Yeah. Anyway. Mm. But we need to deliver this content to you because it's so important that we get these messages about camels out there um, because we, we love to share any information that we come across and have. And I would say that today's information, Russell, for you, it's been in the making sort of ever since you really came into camels in the first place. So that's what, 20 years or something? Oh, yeah, oh, somewhere around that point of mark, yeah. Um, yeah. D- d- just before you dive into mm-hmm. it, I will say oh. to people <laughs> just that um, we're, we're asking for reviews on this podcast because reviews help us be seen to other camel lovers and other camel people if, um, you know, if they want to hear about camels and information and chit chat and all that sort of stuff, because really this is the only place on the internet. And look, if you know of another place on the internet that does camel let us know. talk like this, do let us know because yeah. we have not been able to find it and we would love to love more people to talk about camels. Oh, the more discussion, the better. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, if you're loving these episodes or maybe this is your first episode and you're, you're enjoying it or you, you do enjoy it once you get to the end, please leave us a review on iTunes. So um, if you've got an iPhone, that's the little purple purple app <laughs> and just click on that and subscribe to our channel and yeah, um, leave a review there because that, like I said, helps other people understand what this is about and they see that other people enjoying it and the more camel information out there the better and so if you leave so, a review yeah yeah sorry <laughs> maybe my mind's gone with this cold uh, yeah it's got the cold if you if you leave a review um and we we will read it out on the podcast and you will get a special something sent from us directly. So if we read it out, we'll give you instructions on how to contact us, and um, we'll send you something camel-related in the mail. Mm. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. I'll go for that. No, you can't do it. Oh, <laughs> oh. All right, so today's topic, um, it's about the feral herd in Australia, and what we're doing about it, and uh, what's the possibilities of what we could be doing about it. So it's something that's very close to my heart, um, having seen you know a lot of wild herds out there, knowing what's going on um, from a government perspective, as well as um, from different pastoralists and their attitudes or you know the way how they're handling feral herds that come onto the pastoral lands that they have a lease on, and uh, and also the general public um, perception about the wild herd because it's something that a lot of people 
don't know a great deal about. It's out there and it's a long way away. And of course, that's a very big paddock out there in the arid zone. And, uh, and, and a lot of people, when they're traveling throughout Australia, they're looking forward to seeing a camel, a wild camel, and nine times out of 10, they don't because it's a big paddock. But believe me, it's a, it, it is a problem, it is an issue, and it is something that does need to be addressed and addressed sensibly. And uh, I think that's the key word that I can think of, um, of how to address this issue. So this subject is a really sensitive subject because obviously if there's animals involved, there's emotions involved, and um, yeah, it, it can be a real play, really, because... You know, there's there's times, like, I understand the situation here in Australia. And maybe, Russell, you can give us, a, like, for those that aren't even aware, because a lot of people aren't aware of what's happening in Australia, the fact that we're killing wild camels and not utilising them or whatever. So do you want to just give people an overview of what's actually happening in Australia from, what was it, six, uh, eight years ago, I think, when they started seen there was a problem well they've always seen that there is a, a an issue um but let's go back even further into the history i love the okay story. so the history is really important as to how come australia ended up with a herd of feral wild camels and um it's a, it's a really cool history i mean like you know the outback would not be what it is today without the camel and the outback meaning that we have towns and, and or little cities, cities in yeah. in the outback of Australia. Um, the pastoral companies. Yeah, there's lots all of that. Yeah, there's companies. There's yeah. actually a, an economic industry yeah. um, because of camels. So start from the start with the Afghan camel ears, and I reckon. Okay. Well, uh, the very first camel, very first camel. Um, was actually used for a bit of exploration, but unfortunately for him, he um, he uh, got shot by his owner um, because he'd accidentally gone ahead and knocked a gun that was cocked and loaded, and the gun went off and it shot his owner. Didn't shoot him, um, no, well, it wounded him, and he got angry and shot the camel out of anger. So that was unfortunately for the very first camel that came into Australia. Then um, the next lot of camels, well, there's, there's sort of you know, other camels that have come into Australia, but uh, a very big, large number of camels came for the Burke and Wills expedition. Yeah. Well, the ill-fated Burke and Wills expedition. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you know about the Burke and Wills expedition, if you're from overseas and you don't know much about the Burke and Wills expedition, um, they were attempting to find a route through from the southern states in <coughs> Melbourne all the way to the northern coastline of Australia, uh, basically for an overland telegraph line. And there was a bit of a race going on uh, because whichever state in Australia had that overland telegraph line, uh, they're the ones that had the power and uh, had, you know, the information direct from Europe and England. So the Birkin Wheels expedition it was ill-fated. Uh, they did die out there, um, made a lot of mistakes. But interestingly enough, though, Tara, um, that uh, they did use camels there. They used horses. They even had a wagon full of wood, believe it or not, for their <laughs> fires. Okay. Now this is this is just ignorance of you know not yeah. knowing and what was out there. Yeah. And uh, they had a lot of money uh, set up for this expedition, so had to spend it. So why not get a wagon full of wood? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so, but interestingly enough. The vast amount of the outback was actually discovered because of the Burke and Wills expedition, not from Burke and Wills themselves, but from the um, people that organised search parties from all directions around Australia to find Burke and Wills. This is how big this expedition was for oh, Burke so and Wills. So they got lost and people actually explored Australia, Australia by finding them. By accident, if you'd like to say. Yeah. They went out to try to find Burke and Wills. Yeah. Okay? And uh, from all different directions. Hence, a lot of Australia was discovered, the outback of Australia was discovered that way. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's just a little sideline in history. Kicking along a little bit more, um, Sir Thomas Elder, who had a station up in the Flinders Ranges called Beltana, 
um, in conjunction with a guy called Barr. Um, he saw the potential of camels as far as transportation throughout the outback. So what he did was he went up to northern India and Pakistan um, and got all these camels and got their handlers and brought them back to Australia to set up at Beltana, uh, Australia's first breeding depot for the inland transportation system. That would have been an amazing feat because, I mean, here's this guy, Australian, I assume, or British, you know, descent or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, he's gone over to these third world countries. He's talking to cameleers and whatever, just trying to organise all these camels and all these handlers. And they must have thought it was a little bit crazy, but uh, there was the incentive of money, which is very helpful for those people. So, yeah, just like I think of the organisation that would have had to go into that to it to allow that to happen oh yeah it's just huge i mean uh you know you've got, been years you've got your story. shipping to organize mm. you've got you know your scouts to go overseas to those locations first of all and talk with the people yeah. you know then you've got language barriers and that mm. sort of stuff to work with and um yeah it was a huge deal mm. a huge deal and um, um we were privileged enough to have actually operated our camel safaris on beltana there for quite some time yeah, the history is quite... And the amazing. history is amazing. There's no doubt about it. And even the camels went ahead and drank from the very first camel well in Australia. Mm. Um, you know, so that was pretty cool in, in that respect. But, um, yeah, and so they started this breeding depot. And, uh, and many expeditions actually started from Beltana um, that were looking for the, the route to the northern coastline. But also over to the west being Giles. Um, so there's a lot of exploration that went on as well as the development of the inland transportation system. So by the time that the Cameleers got themselves, they were organised and this inland transportation system was uh, up and running. Which we, is the railway line? No, 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 I'm only talking about the camels. Oh, the camel system. I'm only question. talking about the camels. Because they did help build the railway line. Well, that's another thing, but we'll go to that too. Um, but uh, yeah, there was 10,000 camels in, in total being used for transportation of goods and services to outlining areas. So they were the trains. They were the trains. The train were they good. were the ones. That's... And these trading routes went all the way up to the northwest coast of Western Australia, mm. uh, right across to you know Perth and down to Adelaide and up uh, through to Alice Springs and even further north, um, you know, up towards Darwin Way and over into Queensland and yeah, everywhere, basically on the mainland. So, uh, sorry, Tasmania, you missed out there. On Australia, mainly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you had something else, Tasmania. You, maybe if you'd like to re leave a comment and tell us about how um, the transportation system started in Tasmania, we'd be interested. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, yeah, so anyway, these camels. And, and they went ahead and also helped with the building of the railway line, such as the gun. Um, Gan. Gan, Gan, who yeah. depends which side of the railway line you came from. Um, <laughs> and the car, but they actually <laughs> built the railway line, right? They carried all the metal, all the all the timber, all of the railway um, bridges and the bits and pieces, and even shifted the dirt for you know the, the actual tracks to be laid on. And uh, this was all done by camel. So once moving in time the trains got into vogue and they were choo-chooing choo away and uh, mm. and trucks came into vogue as well by that stage and less and less camels were required yeah. um, there's also another side of the story which involved the um, uh, how can I say uh, sort of like the racism that was going on at the time yeah. and uh, and there was the white Australia policy which also had an effect on the yeah. on the Cameleers um, and uh, I don't want to go down that road we're only talking about the camels here but uh, and it was if, disgusting. It was, it was, I mean, that's where good. we stand on it. It was disgusting. Yeah. yeah. But, we um, don't have that policy anymore, but, obviously. But, um, yeah, so eventually the camels weren't uh, required and the government actually tried to make it very difficult for the camel ears by introducing um, fees, and fees for these services and charges, um, sort of like permit system. And so eventually, people had to have a permit to own a camel. That's right. Which these people who were already poor to start with, they can't afford that stuff. No, that's right. But the government also had their own camels as well. Right. Uh, and uh, occasionally out there in the bush where you, uh, you, you know that you know, the camel ears have been 
around the place you might actually have come across some of these discs that uh, metal disc that were hung around the camel's necks so and right. they were the government um, permit um, wow. uh, government you know issued camel you know permit thing and so what did the government was that, was that just safekeeping of these camels or do you know this uh i'm, I'm not sure but it's certainly something that i could look up yeah yeah, yeah. Really but uh yeah they definitely had uh, government um, um camels as well um and but yeah basically the transportation was now over to trains and also trucks and so the camels weren't required so um I know definitely in Western Australia, now I'm not sure about South Australia or any of the other states, but it sort of seems like a common thread, that uh, the government said, right, okay, we don't need these camels, you need to shoot them. And the cameleers, of course, couldn't do that. Right? You've been working with these beautiful animals, you've known them inside out, and they know you inside out, and, uh, and there's an amazing bond that's going on between you and your camels, and you know, you've done so much together and then you know, someone comes along and says, oh, you've got to shoot them. And that's just not going to happen. And I can not tell only you. that, but I mean, these camels made Australia what it is today. Well, they're, that's exactly written right. written in history. Exactly. We should, we should have done something, really. I mean, like if we're talking political, there should have been a better structure and planning in place. And maybe they never did to start with and it got a little bit out of control with the amount of camels that were coming through. Like the rabbit situation and the fox situation, you know, that we, we've had here in Australia. But... It's, um, I couldn't, like, just think of, you know, our camels. It's, I mean, and these, these are traditional, usually nomadic kind of cameleers that their whole life is focused around a camel. Yeah, um, well, there wasn't a great deal of respect, even though these respect blokes... Respect for the animal and, and, and the, the handlers. Yeah, yes. that's right. There wasn't a great deal of respect, to be honest. Um, coming from the Anglo-Saxon British Empire, um, <laughs> you know, the last bastion, if you like. Um, but yeah, horses were the go, of course, and, uh, and and they still are. And they still are, which is amazing. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and and so, I mean, to give you an example of this, um, <coughs> with some of the photos that you might see of the early explorers, you know, sitting up there on on top of their horses, you know, all in their beautiful, uh, lovely. Uh, suits and all these things that they, you know, they supposedly wore. Um, the reality, carried all those the reality, the <laughs> reality <laughs> is, is that the horses were being dragged along um, and when it came time for a lovely photo, then they'd get dressed up um, and the horses would be taken down the back of a sand dune and the camel, uh, sorry, not the, no, the camels the camel. were taken to the back of the sand dune so they couldn't be Outside. seen. The horses were brought in, you know, all, all shiny and polished up and, uh, you know, put their lipstick on, whatever happens. And, uh, and they had their photos. And, and uh, it's such a, you know, Gosh. and then when the photo shoots were over, horses all undressed and then uh, the camels back and packed up and, uh, and the camels did all the work and the horses were being dragged <laughs> along. I'm sure that times, you know, the horses were definitely um, were, um, being used. But when you think about it, you know, the camel is definitely the perfect animal for... Um, well, they knew you, that right, used from, as they knew that right from the start. Well, That's why they got them here. This is beforehand. This is before Sir Thomas Alder and all that sort of thing. I mean, Giles had camels. He, he understood what was going on. Yeah, but everyone um, knows how well a camel survives out in harsh desert environments yeah yeah it's more just ignorance and arrogance really at the time and you know the british empire is the one that uh, was everyone else was uh, just uh, not part of the party really so um yeah so that's how come we ended up with a whole pile of camels because the, these cameleers went ahead and just released the camels into the wild rather than shoot them and thank god they did well for us i mean the way how we look at it um Yes, there is an issue um, in that there are no natural predators for the camels out in the arid zone. Now, that's probably the key problem that the camel has. Uh, we're the only predator, um, be human beings. And other than that, if it wasn't for human beings, the camels would live a very long and happy life out there and breed. Mm -hmm. and there's your problem. Mm. Okay, there's your problem. Their doubling rate is around about the eight years uh, uh, thereabouts. Um, so if there's a million camels today, if nothing's done as far as reducing those numbers, then there's two million in eight years' time. 
All right, give it another eight years, there's four million, and so on and so on. So there's your problem. And instead of Skippy going down the street like most people think. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, kangaroos down, down the main down street. The street. We'll have camels just walking but around. But the problem yeah. that we're really talking about here is one, management, and two, the fact that as Australia, as a country, we um, we aren't familiar with the camel. Um, obviously, we are. <laughs> this is what that's a whole company based off. We aren't familiar with the camel, and also. Um, like the kangaroo situation here in Australia, we realised there was a problem, as in we, as in the government, and um, we started to eat kangaroos. It's like, well, we've been doing this for thousands of years. Yeah, that's Why right. now? Hello. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it is a problem. Um, and thinking of it from a conservation point of view, all right, so primarily, okay, people often think that, uh, you know, I'm, if you know me personally, um, that I'm just a absolutely one-eyed, mad camel man, you know, who just, you know, I think <laughs> nothing else about camels, it, it's just all camels, everything's related to camels, you know, every time that I have a shower, I'm thinking about a camel, or every time I'm putting on my socks, you know, it has to be my camel socks, or, you know, whatever it might be. It is actually true. It is actually true, <laughs> yeah, that's right. But primarily, I'm actually a conservationist of the um, arid zone. That's, that's critical. If we don't look after our environment, our natural environment, um, then well, what have what we got have left? Got? What have we got? You know, just a, a, a trash heap. But not only that, but you've been out there in the arid zone for years yeah. at a time, walking with camels, you know how pristine it is. You know what the desert can offer us. And I mean, I've been out there not as for a longer period of time as you, but you know, obviously within our company, we go out into the desert and it is incredible why wouldn't we want to preserve this why are we spending so much effort on on um i guess other things like you know like I, it's sort of like when you're out there like i even know <coughs> some station owners for instance when you're out there it's like they think they, they are alone they're very isolated they have a bit of government support but you know if you're in more of a coastal town or whatever you've got more resources at your fingertips but um out there you know it's there's nothing really unless you make well you go even further away from the pastoral companies away from the pastoral lands and out into the um like the dead center mm. if you like uh, the aboriginal lands of um the arid zone um the beauty about the Ar aboriginal lands of the arid zone is there's no fences mm. and uh yeah seriously it's just um it's heaven on a stick um and, and you can actually, with camels, of course, we're tracking with camels. Um, here's a little plug for those people who are thinking about getting into camels for, um, you know, doing some tracking work. Um, you can actually, with camels, go to areas where it is highly unlikely that no one has ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because of surface water and those sorts of issues uh, that, you know, even the Aboriginal people had to consider and, but the Aboriginal people do their country too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, you can't say, you know, exactly that, you know, no one has ever seen those sorts of yeah. uh, types of lands. But... Um, they're not but on the tourist trails. <laughs> they're certainly not on the tourist trails. And when you know that, you know, the nearest dirt track is 500 kilometres away. Um, oh, that sounds like freedom. <laughs> it, it is. There's a freedom. There's a sense of freedom in there. There's a sense of security. Um, and just natural beauty and you know it's quite often that you will come to a location and you think well I can't actually see an invasive species of animal or plant um, possibly here but I just can't see it and uh, and to know that you know that's the original Australia or as close to as what we had prior to colonization you know, it's a beautiful thing out there oh it's yeah it's just beautiful it would take you back in time and it does take you back in time yeah um and it's 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 for very few people but it is for selected few people like not everybody's interested in going out there into complete isolation for me and you that's absolutely liberating and it's like it says freedom all over it oh exactly but, and you know you do have to I mean, tracking, I mean, you know, to get out there in the first place. I mean, you know, you do go through a pain barrier every single time. Mm. Uh, and for different people, that's different. that means different things, um, whether it be a physical thing or a mental thing, mm. okay? Oh, yeah. Or it might be a both. I definitely yeah. get both. Yeah. yeah. But once you get through that, and it might take a fortnight, three weeks, whatever, um, but you get through that and then you're starting to track. 
and uh, and just, you can you get, get out your there. mojo and off you go. Oh, it's, you become a machine. It's just yeah. wonderful, you know. It's machine a, with a heart and soul. Like absolutely, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, let's get back to the issue of the feral camels and, you know, what's been happening with them. So the government has had over the past 25, 30 years many research papers done. This is the Australian government. Australian government, yeah, and, uh, you know, through various organisations, and the result's always been the same, all right? And the, that result has always been for culling programs to occur. And usually it's helicopter culling programs. This um, is killing. Yeah, mm-hmm. just straight out, um, you know, the helicopter goes up with a, a sharpshooter and uh, they find the camels and from the air they shoot the camels. Yeah, and I have a fact about this. Now, I might get the numbers a bit mis, mis- confused. Mm. But well, I someone thought... can go ahead and comment and um, give us a proper Yeah, number. it's on Google anyway. And yeah. um, I, I wish I'd written this down this fact. But for every bullet fired... To one camel, one wild Australian camel, this includes, this is the cost of it. So yeah. including helicopters, including the shooter and everything like that. It was something like, um, now, I'm thinking in the 300s, um, which it could be in the $300 mark, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're killing a lot of camels, that adds up. I'm pretty sure it was more. It, 300 doesn't sound high enough when you include everything. But the, the, the cost that we're actually paying as taxpayers, so... Well, How right. ironic, we're a camel company, we're paying tax to the government, and where's our money going? Uh, to shoot camels. camels yeah. <laughs> Look, as far as that is cost goes, I mean, that's, that, it can be below and above. Yeah. All right, and it depends on the, um, the culling program at the time and uh, the weather conditions, what's happening as it far as rain. It was just a really and... interesting comparison, though, like, yeah. that this is how much it's costing to shoot them. If we pile up that money into a resource, and um, like a, a banking resource, and then so that we can make an actual uh, program and industry for mustering and, and selling camels internationally or whatever it is. It just gets you thinking. And, I mean, everybody has an... Well, those that know about this have an opinion on it. Yeah. And it's great to hear those opinions. Yeah. Um, and we're about to share ours. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, getting back to the actual cost. I mean, I'll give you a story on that, and everyone likes a story. So sit back, relax, grab your coffee, here we go. Um, it, it was a, a cull that was organised, um, and this was a number of years ago that I'd heard about. And uh, everything was organised, right? So the helicopter, the fuel, the pilot, um, you know, the sharpshooter, um, trucks, you know, there's there's all sorts of things that you don't think about, you know, even catering, whatever. Mm. Um, you know, there's all sorts of um, I know, added, I know added about, costs. about running a business. Okay. So they'd organised this for um, up towards the northern part of the Simpson Desert and, um, and they had a specific date. Here we go. This is not going to be the one, you know. But then it rained, right? And it rained enough to disperse the herd. Right? So not the herd was no longer concentrated around where the water holes were, yeah. but uh, now they had the opportunity of walking across country and they did, they dispersed. But they had their date and they still went ahead. Now the cost per bullet, per successful kill had escalated enormously because they didn't get nearly as many camels as yes. what they thought they were going Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Okay. But that, that they just, uh, well, you know, there's simple science attached to that, you know. It rains, cancel. It's not going to work um, because the camel's dispersed. And that's our taxpayers' money again. So, you know, I've got a little bit of a beef about that sort of thing. Um, but um, I do think that there's a much better way of handling this feral herd issue. We have to recognise a couple of things, um, and I know I've talked to you at length, Tara, about this, but we have to recognise that there's no natural predators out there. Uh, So the numbers are going to increase anyway. And even though it's a big paddock, there's a number, there's limited amounts of resources yes. as far as the water holes, as far as the land Especially space. Especially when droughts strike too. Yeah, that's right, exactly. So, you know, we, we need to do something to manage that number of the herd. I recognise, and many of us cameleers recognise, that there is no way known we're ever going to get rid of the camels in Australia. Mm-hmm. They're here for good. We have to accept it. 
I've accepted it. Uh, we cool have to accept it. Because I mean, a lot of, I would, well, all of our herd, except for one camel, so we've got 14 at, at the moment, you know, it fluctuates, but out of our actual trekking, working company herd, we've got 14 camels, all of them, bar one, who was born to us, they were all from the wild. From the wild, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, these are lucky camels. They're, they're alive. Yeah. <laughs> they haven't been shot. Absolutely. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, we need to do something, okay? From a conservation point of view, we need to save that arid zone from getting stripped out by an ever increasing population of camels. So is it just camels? It's not just camels, it's horses, it's donkeys, it's any it's, cattle it's, that have strayed, you know. I yeah. mean, gee whiz, I reckon, you know, there'd probably be a couple of giraffes out there at such a big paddock. <laughs> Um, there could be hippopotamuses too. I doubt it, but you know, I mean, I'm not saying that you know there are giraffes out there, but elephants um, <laughs> could be elephants. You're who joking. We don't really know. No, who would know? But, but that's what we've heard about said. black panthers going missing from the circus. Well, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, there's always uh, the yeti and all those sorts of things too. Um, but definitely, you know, camels, horses, donkeys, wild cattle. Um, you know, there's there's a lot out there. And uh, the feral herds of all these things need to be managed. So one of the ideas that uh, my mentor um, into you know, camelleering, Phil G, uh, what he came up with um, and has been working on ever since tirelessly in South Australia there was to... Shout act- out to Phil G. Yeah, good on you, Phil. Keep it going. <laughs> I'm still plugging it too, mate. Um, <laughs> is, is that we actually capture... On a systematic level, um, you know, camels from the from the wild, right? And we change the laws of pastoral lands, right? And the pastoral the pastoral boards, you know, loosen up some of this red tape, so that you know it's not just cattle or sheep or anything else about it. But you can okay. So the exist. current laws, just to be clear, the current laws of pastoralists out in our back of Australia is that they can only um, raise cattle and sheep. Is that correct? Nearly. Nearly. Right. Phil well, has somehow, um, I believe, I mean, you know, this was the word, and uh, if someone wants to clarify this, uh, leave a comment, um, but I believe that he has somehow, through through Parliament or through the Pastoral Board, um, allowed it so that uh, pastoral companies in South Australia can actually co-graze. Right. I am. Okay. okay. Well, that that's that's a step forward. It's a step forward. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. there is benefits, and the, oh, let's talk ca- about that later. Yep. Well, they, well, we 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 sort of come up now. So there is benefits of cam- camels and cattle co grazing. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 You already said it. All right. Uh, yeah. Well, co grazing. Um, well, for a start, the camels eat plants and the uh, plants and the, the herbs and that sort of stuff that the cattle don't. Yeah. Um, camels. And they're, they're sort of foragers. They're not grazers. Yeah, browsers. Yeah, yeah. What did you say? Browsers. Yeah, the browse. The yeah. Browse, not well, graze. They... Well, forages is the same thing. You forage. They, they, forage means everything. Yeah. Well, they, they do eat a bit of grass, but only if they have to. If they've got... Grass is only 8% of their diet. And, yeah, yeah. like if they've got other stuff to eat, they will eat that. Yeah. You know, herbs and spices. Yeah. And... <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> the secret recipe. Hey, that's it. Um, but, yeah, and, and by, by actually removing some of the uh, weeds that are on the ground, yes. um, that it allows, allows for more growth. grass to come through, so therefore there's more feed for the cattle. Yeah. But more importantly, the camels will go ahead and, uh, and drop their bacteria in the water troughs when they have a drink, mm. um, their gut bacteria, and the cattle, when they have a drink, pick these bacteria up, and that gets lodged in their gut, mm-hmm. and these bacteria break down the cellulose and the, the fibres and everything of the, the foods even further than what the cattle's gut bacteria normally are, mm-hmm. and so they actually get fatter. Wow. And this has been proven in scientific research Which overseas. Which we can't seem to find on the internet anywhere. It's overseas. It's overseas It's overseas, it's overseas research. Yeah, it's not it? Australian. Yeah. Oh, okay. No. For some reason, I thought it was an Australian research. I but wish that we... I had a couple of hours of search on Google. But oh, look, you know, it. we need to have... We don't have any real scientific studies here in Australia no. of camels. No, we? no. We need we've, some grants. We need reports. some scientists. Yeah. Um, and one of these research institutes to actually seriously look at pastoralising camels. Absolutely. And I know that, you know, there's, there's been attempts in the past and uh, there's certainly been attempts on, um, on uh, freehold land. Yeah. 
Um, there's, there has been an attempt. Um, what do you mean by attempts? Attempts of what? Uh, of, of pastoralism. Of studies? Pastoralism. Of camels. Okay, yes, got you. Uh -huh. Um, but uh, yeah, and there has been um, a very good experiment with BHP and Phil, mm. um, where they had a herd Phil of four hundred. Yeah, Phil G, um, a herd of four hundred, and they were selling camels overseas um, mm. for this about sixty odd camels a, mm. a year, sixty three mm. or so camels a year, um, and it was all organic. And the pastoral board actually wrote that uh, they didn't even recognise there was an animal on the property. Right, which is a big one. It's a biggie. Mm. Um, so like no, no damage to the areas where, like, uh, especially around waterholes where cattle, cattle, sorry, cattle's drink. You can definitely tell that there's cattle there because they leave all their their hoofed animals. Their hoofed animals. Yeah. So and camels are not. So they're just gentle on the environment. Um, and obviously they had enough land that they weren't stripping every tree under the sun. They were just going, going and get their bits and then go to the next tree sort of thing and tree or shrub or whatever. Well, the very fact that, you know, out of 64 water points on a pr property, okay, uh, for cattle, you know, because cattle can only move, uh, it's a radius of 10 k's away That's from right, that water yeah. point. That's why you have a crisscross of uh, water uh, pipes and troughs yes. and yeah. you know, bores and all sorts of stuff, which must be horrendously expensive for the cattle. Um, you know, industry. Yeah. Um, but out of 64, you can take 63 away for camel. Yeah. Uh, on that same property. Absolutely. And, and so and you're that, a huge cost. Oh, so that's amazing. See. Like this, this is exciting, you know, like, and I'm glad we're talking about this on the podcast because I'm sure a lot of people aren't aware of this, that, you know, I think the more people that are aware of the benefits of, of pastoralizing camels or whatever you want to call it, the better it's going to be for Australia and um, to, I guess, in some ways, you know, like preserve might be, might be the right w word, but help manage the, the wild herd in Australia. I mean, we try to do our part. Like we, we refuse to breed camels on our farm because, it, um, oh, how, how can you say? Emotion, well, there's enough out there. Well, emotionally speaking, why would we breed when we've got a shit ton of camels out there in the desert? Like, um, you know, you can get them one way or another, whether that be directly or from a third party and stuff like that. So sure. that that's something that, uh, as a core, as a value of us, is we we don't breed. Um, totally. The, the calf that we did have here, the mother was pregnant when she came. So, yeah. um, you know, it's a it's an ethical thing more than anything. Well, yeah, and look, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, every camel that we've that we and other people who getting into camels yes. and you know having them as pets or you know using them for riding or yeah. their own expeditions or setting up their own business whatever it might be um, but each camel that comes from the wild and gets trained and you know hopefully trained correctly you know, mm. with uh, humanity uh, mm. in mind um, that uh, you know that's another camel saved absolutely and um, absolutely and, and uh, you know we're actually doing our part if you like of systematic removal of the animals from the feral yeah you know, herd. like we're only yeah like we're a small percentage of people but we're helping where we can well exactly and look you know just um not so long ago um i saw a a truck it was three trailers yeah. and this truck uh, it was full of camel and it was heading down <coughs> to the peterborough abattoirs in south australia there yeah now they were going in, for meat or they were what? going for meat yeah probably dog well dog meat i presume because well who knows i mean we've you and i let's face it we've seen camel burgers in coles that's true yeah coles so, is one of the major supermarkets in australia and we, we try we actually buy them purposely just to fund them so we've got like a freezer stock of well, yeah. camel burgers <laughs> but the just, kids do like them yeah, yeah. they do they yeah. think it's a bit of a novelty yeah. and, oh, you know, like i know it sounds really weird that like we adore camels and we love them and you know but we eat them as well do we, we eat meat we obviously do not eat our pet camels and no. we just wouldn't but um, it, it's everything we've just spoken about. There is a problem in Australia with the wild camel herd. What do we do? Rather than let them run wild and they increase to millions and millions over periods of eight years and eight years and eight years, it, it's got, it's a problem and we won't we won't have an a, a, like you say an important part of the arid zone in Australia, um, which is part of the whole ecosystem. Well, you've got to look at you've got to be able to look after every aspect of the ecosystem that's yes, over here, and that is part and, of it. Yeah, absolutely, and you know the arid zone. Yeah, we've got to think about okay. So, how can we remove these animals? Is culling the way to go? Yeah. 
No. Um, well, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that, that's the emotional you know, whack. Let's go for it. Okay. Well, but, just be, I'm, a, I'm a businesswoman as well, and I, I do. I understand. Like, yes, it's going to take time and years to build, but it can be to a point where, like, I mean. What other day in a week do we not get an email from somebody overseas wanting for us to export them cannabis? Absolutely. And this actually leads to, okay, so how would this system set up? How could it be set up? And what are the, what are the hurdles? Because yeah. this is where, you know, it's very nice to be altruistic about it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like everyone that I speak to, you know, say, oh, yeah, no, we shouldn't be shooting them. We should be eating them. I should be on the supermarket shelf. We should be exporting, you know, mm. camel meat and all this sort of stuff. So here's the idea, okay? So let's have a look at the goal that would be the most practical goal for the environment, number one. All right, the first thing, number one, the environment, the camels themselves, and for business. Right, so Econ economics. For economics. E economic. Yeah. Economy. Okay. That's what I was trying to say. Do we have the market to start with for camel meat? In Australia? The answer is... No. Yes. What, here in Australia? Absolutely. Why would you say that? Right, okay. I know there's uh, a market overseas. Yeah, no, there's a huge market here in Australia. Why do I say that? It's because of the way how Australia is is developing. Yeah. All right? We're getting a lot of people who are making Australia home from overseas countries that are camel cultured. Yes. Of which case it is commonplace in those camel cultures to eat camel meat. Yes. Right? Now we're talking big numbers here. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and, and there's also a thing that I, I can't remember where I watched it, but, you know, there was this, um, this sort of study, mini study sort of done that, you know, X amount of years, rather than eating pro getting our protein from cows and sheep and all that, like meat source, it will be bugs. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, and people are already starting their business selling bugs. Bugs, like, yeah, protein. that's right. So, We've got these camels sitting And here. the world is changing. Yeah. Uh, the global population to. is increasing. The United Nations has already declared, or some many years back actually now, uh, that we're already protein deprived. Yeah. So we need to look at sources of protein. Out there in the wild, uh, uh, arid zone, we've got a resource of protein, mm -hmm. if you want to look at them that way. Okay, so is there is there a market? Yes, there is. There could be. There well, is. There is, yeah. there is, but the infrastructure is not in place. Yes. Okay, the systematic infrastructure is not in place. The marketing is not in place, um, and for, and for the Joe it. Blow in the street, you know, to say, "Oh, what do I eat? Camel meat?" Uh, it requires a marketing program. I yeah. mean, you know, how big, how big is was uh, the lamb sales? Um, after um, you know, John the, 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 oh, no, he what started was his, advertising. What, what was his? Uh, well, there was no. Uh, no, you're talking Paul Hogan. Oh, Paul Hogan. <laughs> John Hogan. That's his brother, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, what's his, what's his Yankovic or not Yankovic? Um, uh, anyway, yeah, the Australia Day. You know, you have the lamb. Chef. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, you have lamb and you know, Australia lambsies and all that sort yeah, of business and yeah. blah blah blah. And uh, and the sales for lamb. Yeah. Just went skyrocketing with yeah. that marketing campaign. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you know, marketing is is also a thing as well. Well, it needs somebody who's committed to it because I mean, our company is not focused on exporting as much as um our company name Australian Camels. It, it sounds like, sounds we, like are, we are, but we're which not. we're going through branding rechange. So stay tuned for that exciting news. Um, you know, we uh, we constantly get requests on sending three hundred head of. Camels, they want six oh. bulls and, you know, this amount of cows and calves and all this sort so of stuff. So this is where we're leading to, okay, with, with uh, the ideal, is that there's a systematic method of capture from the wild zone and transport it to what is now pastoral lands, that's usually for cattle, but instead we convert to camel or have a combination of the two. Yes. Uh, so that you know, we've got a record of how many <coughs> camels we've got, where, and all this sort of stuff. So if you do end up with an order um, of three hundred cows and uh, you know all at two years of age mm. um, from uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, or wherever, um, then that can be sourced mm -hmm. and therefore trucked and shipped. Um, 
you know, whether it be live export, and look, I'm not going to go into that argument of whether live export is a good thing or a bad thing or indifferent. I'm just saying that, you know, this is the problem of actually Retake, fulfilling retake, retake, fulfilling retake. Yeah. these sorts of orders. Yeah. We don't have that systematic sort of approach. Yeah. Um, then you've got your trucking. Now, this is another problem, is that, okay, the capture of those for, uh, for the camels from those areas in the in the um, arid zone it's very isolated very remote so first of all you've got your roads that need to be you know restructured for that um and then you've got uh you know single decks rather than double decks yes, which is usually for cattle animals <laughs> okay so there's a le- you know you're lowering your your profit margins there yes all right um so you know there are a number of structural and also then there's the number one thing that's preventing it all from happening and that's the will to make it happen that's what i was about to say like there's a whole pile of commitment that we don't have because we focus on training and, and education and stuff like yeah. that it, it's a, it's a full-time job not only for the one person involved but it'd have to be a whole company structure well it's more like you know the will of the government to start with to make it happen okay to reduce that red tape okay to make it available so that you know someone with an investment you know can actually make this and a risk taker too because it's not guaranteed it'll work out but there could be stuff that does work totally you know yeah and um and you know and it can happen that's the whole thing yeah all right, it can happen. It's so right. the benefits, I mean, you know, for you know this to actually occur is that number one, we maintain the feral herd number. Yes. The second thing is that, uh, you know, employment in in this area, the third, especially Aboriginal so employment. So it will increase employment. Yeah, it'll this, increase employment. This is what excites me about this is, you know, obviously the, the camels are being captured in Arizona. There's Aboriginal communities out there. There's yep. people that could do with work. Yep. It, it just makes sense. It's a whole other kind of... A, economy system really yeah. um, then you've got you know your pastoral lands so you know the pastoral lands will actually end up better in better condition if it was converted over to camel from cattle we yes. know that through scientific studies yes um, but realistically we're not all going to convert to camel no. unless the world is coming to an end which is highly possible <laughs> well yeah that's right and where's that meteorite and we're, we're, we're eating bugs and you know <laughs> eating camels bugs, that's right um and and the marketing, yeah, you know, the marketing, and uh, you know, to so that uh, you know, camel eating camel meat, well, it's a no brainer. Uh, yeah. Well, we're, we're eating emus now. We're eating kangaroo is is a common thing in Australia. If you say, yeah, it's not an uncommon thing to eat kangaroo now. But how long did it take for us to get there? Well, that's right. You know, and it, you've got to think also what are the health benefits of eating camel meat? Yeah. And uh, yes, there are a lot of uh, health benefits to eating camel meat, and that can easily be googled. Yeah, All absolutely. Right? Yeah, easily. Yeah. Um, that, uh, but yeah. I guess our whole conversation here, just you know, um, you know, in bullet points or, or trying to sort of wrap it up here, is that you know, yes, we have a wild herd here in Australia, yeah. and that's because of, the, of a government the world's largest herd, herd in the world of feral camels. Yeah. yeah, and they're the healthiest too. They're the healthiest, and that's why too. people want our, like um, internationals want our camels. exactly. Um, but it's impossible to get our camels anyway. So, um, you know, so we have this wild herd. Yes, we're shooting them. Australian government is is got funding to shoot the animals to control them, or they the they the herd doubles every eight years. You know, um, which is a whole pile of camels, a lot of camels. And let me tell you one other thing about you know some of the, uh, the, the attitudes need to change as well. That's a, that's another biggie. Um, and I'll give you an example of this, okay? I know well, of Perspectives, one... I think, is also helpful too, is, you know, because a lot of people, they think, oh, my God, you shoot camels in Australia. You send them overseas, but they don't understand, understand the all complexity. that stuff that's going into that. Yeah. The red tape, the politics, the everything. Yeah, yeah. Like, the fuel needed It feels like the a real big yeah. weight on your shoulders, and I really don't... I mean, we've looked into exporting camels and doing that stuff, but it was a huge weight. Oh, like, uh, and it's it, just... Yeah. We'd need piles of people to help us. And, and, and piles of money. And piles of money yeah. back in it too. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So if anyone's out there that's got piles of money, <laughs> <laughs> we're very interested to hear from you. Um, yeah, okay. So um, let, me, let me give you an example of the attitude that needs to change, okay? So a lot of uh, the pastoralists are saying, okay, well, the feral camels go ahead and you know, destroy fences and all that sort of stuff. Let me tell you this that cattle also destroy fences as well. But when you domesticate a camel, 
okay, you actually give it a little bit of training of sorts, you know, even if it's just running through the yards and through yeah. races and stuff like that, you get <coughs> used to, you know, different bits and pieces, they become just like domesticated cattle yes. in that uh, they start to respect things such as fences and yes. that sort of stuff. So, you know, that's, it's sort of like, oh, well, the camels, you know, let's demonise them because the feral herd are going ahead through and uh, destroying all my fences and, you know, it's costing me a fortune. Yes, I know it is, okay? I'm not saying it's not. Mm. But what I'm also saying is that if we went ahead and captured those camels and did, you know, a little bit of training, I mean, it doesn't have to be much for a pastoral, in yes. a pastoral sense, yes. but they, like cattle, also start to learn how to respect these fences. And if you actually had them as a pastoral herd, then you've got an economic benefit down the track. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and okay, to give you this example, okay, there's one, one station up there in the Northern Territory who uh, the owner has made millions from capturing and exporting camels. Uh, he's admitted that, and uh, you know I've seen the video of him admitting it in person. Yeah. Now there's a station not very far away from that particular station, where the they station shoot, being a ranch for those a ranch, yeah, other where they shoot them and shoot them, and uh, you know sort of think, oh, it's too much of an issue, you know, etc. You know, they just come in and destroy the fences, you know, this and that and the other, and they shoot them, and this attitude is quite poles apart. Yes, yeah, you know, there's got one there that's saying, I welcome them. Uh, because I can have an economic benefit from this. Yes. And there's another one saying, oh, we're just, it's costing us so much money per bullet. And, yes. you know, and, yes. and so, you know, if we can make the shifts around the place, then, yeah, we could actually uh, get this thing kicked off. Yeah, and in reality, not everyone's going to be on board with a new idea. I mean, no. I mean, not everyone likes lettuce. No. <laughs> right, <laughs> like I am said. not going to become a lettuce farmer. <laughs> that's right, you know, yeah. and, and that's just, you know, we're, we're all here on this planet to contribute something different. And those that want a beef cattle, they can beef cattle. If those that want a camel, you know, ca camel herd and, you know, get, get, a, get a camel herd going up, and that's well, what Well, yeah, look, let's, let's get real on this, okay? Um, you know, the camel has been demonised in the past. Yes. We need to get rid of that. Yes. Okay? Um, even to the point where during that major big drought that we had um, uh, sort of finished around about the 2008, 2009, yeah. but there was about 10 years prior to that major drought, most of the country pretty much didn't have a blade of grass. Yes. Um, you know, you've got, you know, over, well, I don't know how many hundred million cattle or whatever it is out there, you know, yeah. all trying to, you know, find a blade of grass. And there was all the sheep trying to find a blade of grass, and along with dying, every along other with animal as well. Yes. And the, the prediction was there was only, a, a, what, one million um, head of camel at yeah. that time. So you're looking, you know, very big numbers yes. of cattle, very yes. big numbers of sheep, and very, really insignificant number. Well, not insignificant, but, but smaller, smaller number, number. Of, of camels. But when the dust storm hit Sydney, right, when the dust storm from the arid zone, the dust came whipping up because there was just not a blade of grass. We'd been 10 years in drought and it picked up all the dust and all the dirt and everything had got dumped onto Sydney. Next day, the headlines, camels cause <laughs> dust storm. <laughs> what the hell? Right? Where did that? Yeah, did they, yeah. Did they? It was in the headline. But did the camels call the... I'm <laughs> saying that how could how could anyone with common sense actually even look at that sort of headline yeah. and say, yeah, the camels so caused this. Yeah. Well, yeah, and there's there's a lot of resistance to the camel industry from getting up and running. Yeah. And uh, a lot has to do with an industry that's already well set up yeah. Yeah. and uh, and big money and big investment and therefore big lobbying of the government. Yes, yes. Right. Yes. And, uh, it's a political issue. It's a political yeah, I mean, issue it's as like well. It's like anything that new happening. I mean, we're only a, a small business on a small scale, but if we put some new content out there that's a little bit intimidating or new, people go, oh, you know, especially those that are already familiar with camels, like, oh, they can't do that. Yeah. Or they just say, who are they to do a podcast like this? You know, yeah. like, you know I mean, let's talk about it, people. Start mm. your podcast, talk about camels, or, you know, um, put, put articles up and write articles and start talking more and more about it. Every opportunity that we get, whether it be through our training courses, whether it be something commercially we're doing, we're always talking about the feral herd. So many people go, you know, where did you get your camels from? From Arabia? Uh, no, we didn't. They come yeah. from Australia, yeah, <laughs> you right. know, in our backyard. And, and 
it opens up this whole beautiful conversation about, oh, tell me more about that. And people are so incredibly surprised about how many camels we have, that they're wild, that, you know, you can go and catch them. It's costly, but you can do that sort of thing. And with they, permissions. They're, gonna, they're going to tell their friends and, you know, this whole new conversation is starting. So we need to talk about this more often mm. um, to, to start getting people familiar with the idea, even though the camels have been around here for hundreds of years or yeah. hundreds of whatever it is. 1860, yeah. yeah. So, you know, this is a whole new conversation. So we're grateful that you're listening to us talk about this because everybody wonders why Australia kills camels. Well, we hope that this has given you some insight into why Australia is killing camels. Australia meaning the government, because obviously Russell and I wouldn't go out and shoot camels. It's not our favourite hobby. We'd rather muck around with them. And well, let them. me say, it's, it's not so much the government, really. Yes, okay. okay. Let's, they get, go to, ahead, let's get that straight. They go ahead and provide the funds for to them. an organisation. Yes. All right. So they contract it out yes. for the culling programs. Yes. Okay. And so it's not actually is... like the Prime Minister's going out there, you know, yeah, well, with the, the Prime Minister, where does he get his information? from somebody who from knows something about it and who is that that knows something about that's it that's right and where do the, and talking about information prior to the culling program that they did at the end of the drought there oh, um, the, in 2008 2009 around about then um, the government put out a, a, a paper and it was a discussion paper before policy was to be, be ratified mm -hmm. and they had some photos in this paper now there was photos of cattle damage to mulga trees there was a windmill that was broken halfway <laughs> there was a, a toilet bowl in a toilet block uh, in a community that was smashed <laughs> and they also that this was camel damage and I, I questioned this in the Alice Springs You've been no, someone who knows camels. Yeah, like, I looked at this. What photos. the hell? I said, how on earth can they possibly, in the government discussion paper, say <laughs> that this was ca uh, camel damage and try to convince people, you know, that this was camel damage. Therefore, you know, this is some of the solutions that, you know, we need. It does room. get funny. Number one solution, you know, let's go for a culling program. The usual stuff. It's been talked like that for 20 <laughs> years and that's all the money. With anything bond, so. political, there's the funniest stuff. So I wrote this article in the Alice Springs News and I said, I would love to see how tall those camels could get to break away. Maybe there are giraffes out there. There could be giraffes, that's right, yeah. <laughs> uh, what was the second thing? Oh, the, definitely the mulga. That was definitely uh, cattle damage. It had cattle pads around, you know, the damage was ca yeah. uh, cattle at the hooves because camels flatten the ground. And the third one was, I said, I can't wait to get back out there and find these midget camels who can get inside <laughs> a toilet block and smash a toilet. And the funny thing was, in that toilet were rocks, <laughs> right. right, that actually smashed the toilet. Right. Now, I've lived, you know... Uh, Long in, enough to know camels don't throw I've rocks. I've lived in all <laughs> sorts of locations around Australia and around the world, and I have seen, you know, vandalism and damage. <laughs> and I know, you know, look, you know, to get into a cubicle like that, um, you know, a camel would really, really, really struggle unless it <gasps> sucked in their gut, which is not going to happen. Um, <laughs> and uh, but those midget camels, I couldn't wait. So yeah, the article was in the Earth Springs News. If you, you want a really, that. really kind of fun aspect of, of this very heavy topic and very political, emotionally top, emotional topic, Russell created many years ago those YouTube videos. <laughs> Um, it, it was an animated YouTube video and oh, you've got a person oh, talking oh, and somehow it. like it was a free thing oh, you just did God. up and like if you scroll like to the first few videos ever on our YouTube channel, oh, you'll find God. these animation videos of Russell doing this whole political talk of, you know, one side and the other side about camels should do this, camels should not do that. It was just oh, like... I forgot about those. <laughs> God, I was laughing all the way when I was making this. So go have a look at those. Oh. Like I said, scroll right to the bottom of our YouTube channel because they're there and they're very funny. <laughs> um, but we appreciate you tuning in and listening to Absolutely. our story about Australian camels and um you know, how the government's funding it, who's probing the government to, to fund these wild camel culls. Um, you know, we'll definitely share more on this topic, um, you know, as as people become more interested in it. And um, yeah. let's get this. Is, let's get let, let's let's make a deal here. OK, now well, I've had my say and, uh, and Tara's had her say. Um, so how about you guys have your say? OK, hop on, the, hop on and, you know, leave the comments. And let's have this discussion because it's an important issue. Yes. And, uh, and you know, let's You can get, find let's this on our moving. blog at australiancamels.com or you can find it 
um, on our Facebook page. You can find it on our Instagram. We, we want to hear from you. And, yeah. you know, share this with people you think might be interested because this is such an important topic for Australia. So, and, yes, you know, so not only for Australia, but for the rest of the world because people want our camels. Yeah. We just can't get them out. Yeah, no, that's right. And the world is protein deprived. Yes. So, so eat your bugs. <laughs> in, 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 in essence, okay, so I'll try to wrap up here, you know, personally, I view the, the feral herd as a resource, okay, um, not just from the fact that, you know, we can have beautiful camels that uh, we can train and uh, for riding or expeditions or whatever, but also as a resource of protein, um, leather, um, you know, there's the, the blood serums for the pharmaceuticals, um, yes. um, which is that. another story in itself. Oh, I yeah. mean, there's another blog. Would um, you get someone interview? Like, we should interview one of the scientists. No, that'd be cool. That. Let's do that. Yeah, we'll right. do that. So stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they, they are a resource. And uh, the, I think that we need to recognise that uh, they're a gift to this country. Absolutely. And, uh, and, but we do need to manage it. Yes. Yeah. That's my view. Yeah. And uh, I'm I'm very much on the same page. Yeah. yeah. And I know that a lot of people are as well. But a lot of people aren't. So and that's fine let's too. get the discussion going. Absolutely. Mm. Fire starter. Yeah. In a good way. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks for listening again, guys, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Okay. Happy cavaliering. All right, bye bye. Bye. If you like this information we've just shared with you, you'll be sure to love the free camel ebooks and training videos that we're giving away. We're giving away two camel ebooks, Introduction to Camels and Introduction to Camel Training. Plus, in our bonus camel training videos, we take you through training and handling camels built on connection and trust. And we also share how to understand a camel's way of thinking. This is gold information that you don't want to miss. So be sure to sign up now to get your free ebooks and training videos over at camelconnection.com.